Hello, it's John Logan. I'm back to make another philosophy video, and I know I've been talking about making medieval uh, philosophy videos, and I will. I'm going to make Thomas Aquinas and Augustine. Um, I'm actually going to make that really soon. But I wanted to talk actually about a modern philosopher today, one who I've come to actually respect a lot, and I think has a lot to offer in the philosophical traditions, um, and, or at least you can take fragments of his thoughts um, and apply it and see how it contributed a lot actually to the history of philosophy. Um, but uh, even that, he was also just a good, uh, good person. And this is Immanuel Kant. He's one of the Enlightenment philosophers, and that's why, right? You mentioned that kind of thought if you're a Catholic or you know your history and or you follow a very uh, strict uh, Thomistic philosophy tradition, you're gonna shudder, and rightfully so, because what happened in the Enlightenment was a rejection of basic metaphysics, which is comprised by Aristotle and perfected, I would say, in Thomas Aquinas. And the Enlightenment's threw that all out. So there's a rejection of the Aristotelian tradition, really, um, which is bad because um, Aristotle was brilliant, and um, I won't go into I won't go into the Enlightenment in, in defending that. But Aristotle was brilliant, and that was a bad move. But the moderns offer a lot still, and why I hold to this is that they were necessary. Because if you look at the history of philosophy, you're seeing the ancients, the pre-Socratics, come up with brilliant ideas that they didn't even know were brilliant. Aristotle and Plato, they speak for themselves. And then you get the medievals, and right, and then you see like the applications to the Catholic tradition of philosophy in Augustine, Bonaventure, and Thomas Aquinas, and Duns Scotus. But in the in the Renaissance area, right, if you if you get into that, even at the end, even in Bonaventure, Aquinas. And Dun Scotus going on into that Renaissance tradition of philosophy, it gets complex. They get kind of lost in these terms, um, not totally, but it gets very complex, and it's very much tr philosophy historically becomes looked at as a sort of pure abstraction, and and unaccessible for the normal person, and so that. The moderns were necessary because what they did was, yes, they threw a lot out, but they came to a simplified way of thinking. They, they really brought some clarity in, in just a simple way of thinking. Actually, Kant and a lot of his rejections of what was good, his critiques led to some other th thinkers, um, and I'm thinking in mind, right, Edmund Husserl and Edith Stein, who would actually take up some of those critiques themselves differently, and they would apply it in, I think, a more correct way. But the moderns were trying to simplify things because they recognized, actually, that perhaps we were getting too much caught up in terminology and in overcomplicating things, right? And, and God is, and Thomas Aquinas says this in Prima Pars, God is the absolute simple. So for the Catholic, an overcomplication of philosophy is not good. Right, it needs to be accessible, right? And I think the moderns actually offered a lot in that, in that they simplified things. But that doesn't mean I hold on to everything the moderns say. But that's a whole conversation. That's more, um, yeah, that's more of a historical outlook of philosophy. But Immanuel Kant was one of those Enlightenment thinkers, and I think he provides a lot. And I'll make another video. Um, I plan to on his aesthetics and his uh, view of beauty. Um, but I want to talk actually today. Um, about kind of, you could say, an epistemological approach of Kant in uh, two terms he would use. Actually, I'm going to mention three, and I think this, the third one's quite brilliant, a great contribution to philosophy, and I'll explain why. Um, so I'll, I won't do too much of a biography of Kant, I just want to explain these two terms. I might make more, uh, or I probably will make more videos on Kant and his aesthetics, and I'll explain more of his life and what was his uh, motivation, but he was very much a good man. Um, and I think contributed a lot. And so with that, I'm going to get into some terms for Kant. And I think it's kind of, if anyone wants to read Immanuel Kant, uh, he's very hard. If any of you have attempted to, attempted it, uh, it, you might know that it is extremely hard. He is extremely dense, and he is a headache. But some terms you certainly need to know, otherwise that headache is just going to be in vain, is understanding a priori and a posteriori. Right, and these are two terms that Kant's going to use a lot. And for him, a priori is in relation to analytic, 
and a posteriori is in relation to synthetic. So what do these mean? Well, a priori in the analytic is a judgment. It's a breaking down of something, right? So if you think about analyzing something, you make an analysis and you break it down. Like you do a book report. You make an analysis and you're breaking down this book. But in the a priori analytic, a statement such as the bachelor is a man, right? Or sorry, the bachelor is an unmarried man. That's an a priori analytic statement right there. And this is where you break down this statement. The un, or the bachelor is an unmarried man, right? You're experiencing this uh, for the first time. And it deals with this analyzing. But if you analyze this statement, the bachelor is an unmarried man. Well, unmarried man is already presupposed in bachelor. So you actually don't really learn anything, right? There's no new knowledge in an a, pri or, yeah, an a priori analytic statement. Now, that's a very uh, crude, perhaps, uh, and very uh, dumbed down example of a statement that would be a priori analytic. It gets a little complex, but that, that gets the general gist. There's no new knowledge in it, right? Because the predicate is presupposed in the subject, right? The predicate being unmarried and the subject being uh, bachelor, right? It's presupposed that he's a single man, an unmarried man. Right, so no new knowledge. The a pastori uh, synthetic would seem to be what would offer more knowledge because in the synthetic, right, you make a building up of something. An a pastori is built on experience. It's built on a sort of empiricism, right, a scientific method. You test something. So you look at cause and effect, right? You see the ball hit the wall and it bounces. You learn something new about the natures of things, seeing this kind of cause and effect, right? We see this in science. What we learn, we test it, and if we do we do these modules, right, we see what happens to the cause and effect. That's the a posteriori and uh, or sorry, a posteriori synthetic. That, right? it, it's a judgment that explains concepts. It, it's it's a very logical structure, you could say, and it, it's very much built on experience. Whereas a priori is before experience. Right, and you see that in that again that example of the um, the the bachelor is an unmarried man. Right, it's not necessarily that you're experiencing that. This is just a statement that's uh, that's existed before. You know, you're experiencing it. But the, so the a priori you learn nothing new, but the a posteriori you learn something new through cause and effect and that empiricism. Okay, pretty simple there, or that, that seems somewhat simple. And that might make reading Kant a little easier. But it doesn't end there, actually, uh, and a lot of people would leave it at that. But if you continue to read Kant in his um, sort of epistemological approach and his critique of the power of judgment, he makes a very bold and interesting claim, and it's actually going to make way for a lot of movements in uh, philosophy. Uh, and actually, it would make a, quite an impact on um, the phenomenological thought. And so he's going to actually argue that there's such a thing as an a priori synthetic. So now remember, we, we mentioned a priori, but that's with analytic. You don't learn anything new right? in that statement, right? The bachelor's an unmarried man. But he's going to argue that there's an a priori synthetic, that you can actually have something before the experience, before you're experiencing it, and you actually learn something new in this a priori experience. Uh, and... Right? When I mean, you're like, wouldn't that be a pastori with the empiricism? Well, think about it. This would be an example of what he means by an a priori synthetic. If you take the numbers 3 plus 4, okay, so we have 3 plus 4, and we say that equals 7. Okay. That was, in, in that very sense, a very synthetic a priori, right? And why is it a priori? Well, let's explain why it's synthetic. That's easier. Synthetic, right? It's like the a posteriori, right? It's like the experiencing of this. It's like doing math. You experience it. You learn cause and effect. 3 plus 4 equals 7. Cool. How is that a priori? Well, think about it. 3 plus 4 equals 7 is not justified on that one experience of performing the action, right? Because if you, if you do continually do the math, 3 plus 4 will always equal 7. 2 plus 2 will always equal 4. That's the beauty of logic. That's the beauty of truth. It will always be that way. So this statement, this equation, is not justified on one experience, right? And furthermore, this is our truth, 
that's existed before my actually adding 2 plus 2 and 3 plus 4, right? That's not dependent on my, it's just truth, it's just logic, that's how it is, right? And this is very much a foreground of what Hildebrand would use in a value theory or the axiological basis of ethics, um, which is its own talk and I won't go into that. But, right, do you see that? 3 plus 4 equals 7, all right, you learn that in a synthetic experience, but it's actually a truth that was before my experience. And it's actually an a priori, right? So that makes it a priori, and that makes it synthetic. But you also learn something new. Not only do you learn 3 plus 4 equals 7 in the experience, but 7 is not reducible to 3 plus 4. 9 is not reducible to 3 times 3, right? Not merely reducible, I should say, right? Because you could have the combination 6 plus 3. You could have to equal 9. Uh, for the 7, you could have 5 plus 2. You could have 6 plus 1, right? So you learn something new about this nature of 7, right? In this experiencing, in this math, in this a, a priori synthetic, right? So it's something that existed before your experience. It's not justified on 1. And you actually learn something new, right? And that's totally different than the a priori anal analytic where, right, the bachelor's unmarried man, right? Before your experience and you learn nothing new. This is an a priori experience where you're actually learning something new. And when I say that this would build and develop a lot of different thoughts and eventually lead into the phenomenological thought, right? That's what they, right? If we go back to phenomenology, right? That's on the experiencing, the consciousness of something, right? And so if your consciousness of this sort of the subjective experience, you're experiencing this, right? Like an a priori or like an a posteriori, it would seem. But if you're Dietrich von Hildebrand, you're going to recognize that some things exist or, or have a value. That's what axiology would look into is sort of the value system. It has a value independent of my experience, right? The, the, the justice, right, is just independent of my performing justice, right? That's a value independent of my performing a just act, Right, and so that this is a huge breakthrough in philosophy. Right, a priori analytic, okay, cool epistemology, a posteriori synthetic, all right, empiricism, and it it has its benefits. A priori synthetic, this is massive. This is huge, and this is what the phenomenologists would kind of build off of into the theory of consciousness of, and what Husserl would look into eidetic reduction, which is another way of him saying that we can come to essences through the experiencing right studying phenomena so this is this is a wonderful contribution to philosophy that Immanuel Kant has provided um, for all the things that he said that might be wrong and uh, some just are wrong this is brilliant um, even if he perhaps didn't perfect it to its full extent he doesn't talk about it in a deep deep extent um, but it's there and it, it's a great contribution to philosophy and it, it's brilliant right because it seems so simple and uh or at least hopefully it seems simple when i gave these examples but i mean this is this was a concept that just wasn't in the philosophical traditions right it, it wasn't experiencing the, these a priori analytics everything a priori was didn't, didn't teach us anything but now we're actually learning through an a priori synthetic. We actually can learn new things in the experience because they exist outside of that, or it's not justified by that one experience. So that is Immanuel Kant and his kind of a little bit about his epistemology, you could say, but um, very much uh, his terms and that, yeah. So that's the Kantian thought, and I think a priori synthetic is a brilliant contribution to philosophy.